Good morning, everyone. Ready to start? All right, so it looks like I'm the only one who's not ready. All right, good to see you. Um, again, J Prime, enjoying the conference? Can't hear you. Uh, that's, that's the proper answer. You can, you can do better, though. Come on, J Prime. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So, my name is Milan Jankov. Uh, I work for this company called LifeRay. Anyone familiar with LifeRay? Uh, nope. Okay. That's better, though. Uh, it's better than uh, being familiar with the wrong thing. <laughs> so, uh, I work with uh, this company called LifeRay. We do a bunch of things. I'll show you in a, in a second. Uh, and uh, I go by my full name on Twitter. So, if you want to uh, comment on the talk today, feel free to uh, do so on Twitter. And um, I need to make a few excuses before I start. Uh, this is a new talk, and it has some sharp edges, so don't expect uh, that uh, it's all going to go smooth. Hopefully it will, but you know, just, to, just be warned. Also, this is not a talk about a technology that you're going to start using tomorrow in your production systems. This is a more of a conceptual talk. So I'm presenting to you an idea that is being in development and uh, development as an idea, not as a tool or something that you can just put together in your production systems. So the talk is more about uh, awareness, about getting you to think about things um, and get you to collaborate and, and tell uh, how that works in your particular environments. So it's not going to be this is the tool and this is how, it use it, how you use it, but rather conceptually how we approach things like dependencies and contracts. And uh, a little bit of intro. Uh, as some of you, most of you are not familiar with LifeRay, and those who are may be thinking that we are a portal company because this is what we've been doing for the many, many years. We used to build a portal platform. Um, but things have changed for the last several years, so we've now built all kinds of different things. Like the LifeRay platform uh, is a general purpose uh, platform to build applications on top of it. And around that, we have a bunch of other um, uh, products that, that are open source, and you can just go and download and use them. Uh, and as you can see, they're in all spectrums from backend to mobile and JavaScript and pretty much any, any area of, of software development. Uh, and while we build those, we face different challenges. Uh, and so once we face those challenges, we try to figure out how to solve them. So we work with different other companies and organizations like Apache Foundation or Eclipse Foundation to solve those issues. And every time we figure out a good solution, we release those as an open source project. And so the concept that I'm going to be presenting you today is, uh, is a kind of my um, a development on top of a challenge that we faced, uh, which is managing dependencies. Remember this time when we all used the new keyword? Uh, anyone still doing new? No? No, because after some, I mean, I guess you're not old enough to remember this time. Because then the spring came and introduced us to this thing called Beans, and everyone started doing nice XML files. Remember those times? All right. But that wasn't enough, so we ended up doing this, right? And I guess that's what you guys are doing today, right? You're just using annotations, and you wire components together, and the world's beautiful. Uh, what? Why? Why we did that? Why we resigned with the beautiful new keyword? Well, it wasn't about easier or faster. It was because we realized that if we wired things outside of our code, this gives us a lot more flexibility. We can do a lot more things that otherwise would be hard to do in the code, like, for example, introduce a, um, a transaction uh, uh, scopes uh, on, on already existing classes and things like that, like interception, interceptors and all those beautiful things that we all over or we use all over the place, right? So the, the, the change was not only, oh, let's write a little bit less code. In fact, we actually wrote a, a lot more code. We used to write this long XML files, but it was giving us something that we couldn't do otherwise. 
Remember those times? I know the answer, you don't. I'm old enough to remember them. In the early days, that's how we used to ship software. Every single project had lips or depths folder, and it was full with libraries. And this, is, this was where you get your dependencies. So you need to put your dependencies in those folders and then have a build system getting it from there. And then Maven showed up and said, well, wait a minute. What if we can arrange those dependencies in a declarative way so we can just say, instead of putting a bunch of you know, hundreds of megabytes of jar files someplace, we can just declare them someplace and there's going to be a central repo where we can download it from them. And this was indeed nothing but easier and faster. Uh, because it didn't change the way things work. Basically, what you're doing with Maven is the exact same thing. You still get a bunch of jar files at the end of the day, except they're in different folder, uh, and uh, you don't have to manually download them. The, the, the tool does it for you. But conceptually, it's the same thing. It just gets a bunch of jar files, throws them in some place, and, and puts them in the on the class path for you. That's all it does. So we changed the way how we store and distribute files, but we didn't, but we introduced a new issue, the dependency hell. And uh, well, not that it wasn't there before, but because before you were like doing stuff manually anyway, so it was natural that you're gonna have to solve dependency hell manually, and, like like you do, like you put your jar files in, in the lib folder. But when Maven showed up, everyone was expecting Maven to actually solve this problem, which it didn't. So we, in Maven, we have transitive dependencies, and we love this. So we, are, uh, like, uh, we use an artifact, and that artifact uses another artifact, and that's cool and great, up until the moment where you realize that all of a sudden you have a conflicting dependencies. Some, something depends on the version, something else depends on another version, and you need to figure out by yourself uh, which version is the right one to use in this particular environment. Maven does some heuristics. It allows you to, um, uh, it, it can pick automatically the newest version and things like that, but that is not always the case. Um, okay. So another thing that showed up in Maven was the version ranges. How many of you are using version ranges in Maven? How many of you are aware that there are version ranges in Maven? Like a few people. That's what I, that's what I figured. Um, so a lot of people don't even know that you can, you can say that depends on version from to. Um, and this is basically another way of defining uh, heuristics. I basically say, uh, pick a jar file in, in this range. But still, it, it doesn't solve the problem when you really have a conflict. And SLF4J is the most famous example of that, uh, which uh, many, many, really many projects face. Like, okay, I have this library that uses logging, and this library uses logging, and which SLF4J goes at my final um, application. So another thing is scopes. Um, so Maven decided that uh, we can actually nicely divide those dependencies, so those are only compile time. By the way, how many of you think that Maven has compile time only dependencies? No, that's good, because they don't, they, the compile time are also runtime automatically in Maven. You cannot define a compile time only dependency in Maven. Um, so uh, we, we started div dividing those dependencies into those scopes. So those are compile time, those are runtime, those are provided. And then when you assemble an application, it's again you that needs to know what is there to be downloaded, what is there to be provided. If you're deploying your application on a JBoss server, you need to know what libraries are there in the JBoss server. Uh, if you're deploying it somewhere else, you need to know what's provided there to avoid conflicts. And again, it's you that does the, the actual resolving. So, Another thing that is missing is you cannot define dependencies between an artifact and something that is not a Maven artifact. There's not an easy way for you to say, oh, by the way, that jar file only works on Windows, right? Or it has native libraries or things like that. And even if you do use some plugins, it becomes cumbersome uh, and things like that. So the, the Maven defines dependencies between jar files, but not between jar files and the rest of the world. So which, which in many cases turns out to be an issue. 
And to sum up all those issues with Maven, I mean, don't get me wrong, Maven is a great tool. It's a lifesaver, and, um, and um, uh, I have nothing against Maven. The, but we're looking here for going up one step further. And the main issue is basically that Maven tells you nothing about why this dependency is there. So you basically say A depends on B, and that's fine, it's a statement, but you don't say why. You don't know what, it, what is the reason that A depends on B. And we need to solve that problem. So basically, if you think about it, it's like we have boxes and we have stuff in the box, right? And what we do with Maven is we can say that box depends on that box, right? And, and, and we're good to go. Well, reality is different, though. In reality, an item in one box depends on an item in the other box. And, and that is the actual dependency. The dependency is because a class here cannot be compiled if the other class is not on the class path. So your actual dependency is between classes and packages and stuff like that, not between boxes. It just makes it easier to reason about things when you bring it one level up and think about box depends on other box. Okay, so what we can do with that, uh, about it? Let's say we have this guy, like a magical thing, that can look inside a jar file and actually see what is the actual dependency, what is the reason a box depends on another box. So in here, you have like a box that contains an item, and you have this guy who can inspect it and say, oh, I see that you need something, X, Y, Z, whatever that is. And what if we can put that information in some metadata in that box? So then you not only have the box, but you also have the information that, well, the actual dependencies is because, dependencies because of those reasons. And then on the other side, you could also have the same guy looking inside that box and say, oh, I see you provide those things. Okay, so I'll put the meta information to state that in that box, this thing is provided. And then all of a sudden, you can switch from managing dependencies to managing contracts. So you don't have to say box A depends on box B, but instead you can say, well, I need this, and I need someone that provides me that information. And someone else is going to say, well, I have that. And then they kind of sign a virtual contract and start working together. So that's kind of the next uh, the next step we can go into, not managing dependencies, but managing contracts. Okay, that's enough talking. Let's see that in action. If it works. How many of you are familiar with a uh, service loader in Java? Okay, a few people. So for those of you who are not, service loader is something that showed up in Java 6, and it allows you to uh, say that a jar file exposes a service, and then another jar file can look for that service, so it introduces uh, Lewis coupling. So what I have here, uh, wait a second, I need to clean that project first. Um, okay. Uh, so in here, I have an API, a project. It's a simple API. It has one interface in it, and it's called calculator, and one method that is ca calculating something based on an expression. So you pass it an expression that supposedly is a mathematical expression, and it calculates the result for you. That's pretty much it. One project, single uh, class in it. In here, I have the implementation, so that's what I call a simple calculator. Don't bother to read the code, it doesn't matter. It's a stupid uh, regex-driven calculator that can only do basic stuff like add and, and subtract, okay? But it's a kind of calculator, it, it can do a few things, okay? And um, I, can, I can actually run that. Uh, to, to show you that this works, but before, let me show you, we're going one step further. So we now have this another project that's called Markup, and Markup is an attempt to define a math markup language. 
So basically, another stupid thing, uh, we have this math tags, and everything in between those math tags is considered to be a mathematical expression, so we want to be able to evaluate that. And uh, how that works is we use the service loader to load a uh, implementation of our calculation service. So if you look in the POM file here, uh, this uh, markup thing only depends on the API because we don't want our markup to depend on a particular implementation on the API because that makes no sense. So we want it to be only dependent on the API. And that's fine. Um, and then uh, we can actually uh, run it and see, oh, wait a minute, one more thing. So now we're building another project that's called Editor. Uh, and Editor is basically a text editor, a Java Swing application uh, that uh, uses the markup, the math markup, to, to render some stuff. So, in other words, it pretty much looks like this. So you have the CalCalp API, then uh, you have the markup, you have some implementation here, and you have editor that depends on, uh, on the markup, okay? And then you wanna build this as an application and run it. Um, okay, so in the API, Another thing that, uh, sorry, in the simple calc, you will see that we also have this thing called um, uh, demo fantastic calc API calculator file. It's a text file that defines an implementation of an interface. This is how Java service loader works. So basically say, if you look for whatever is the file name, this is the implementation. So this is how Java um, uh, jars discover services. Um, and the, the actual loading, you can see it in the uh, markup here. Uh, let me just show you this. This is how it works. Service loader load, it loads the, the other thing. So that's standard Java, nothing fancy in here. Okay, so let's compile this. I have this also, this project called all, that the only reason it exists is so that I can uh, so that I can compile the whole thing together. Um, okay, if I'm lucky, it should compile and work. Okay, and so now this created a jar file, an executable jar file, uh, inside the uh, editor. And if you look into the editor palm, you will see we are using a Maven Shade plugin. How many of you are using Shade plugin? You don't pretty, pretty much you don't do single executable jars, or you use Spring Boot. Um, anyways, for those who don't use Spring Boot, this is probably the most popular way to create a, 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 a runnable jar file. Uh, the Maven Shade plugin say basically say get all the dependencies, put them together in one jar file, uh, and this is your main class, and that's pretty much it. Um, so it's a pretty standard way, so I should be able to run it. Jar. And it's in demo fantastic editor target demo fantastic editor jar. Boom. There we go. Hey, this is my application. Obviously, because it's a Sphinx application, I cannot zoom in, but it doesn't matter. Um, the, the thing is, in here you have some text, and in here you have some math expressions. And so the idea is, when I click the preview button, it's gonna call my markup service, and markup service is gonna call the calculator, and it's gonna calculate and print it out. Do you think it's gonna work? Let's try it. Boom. It doesn't. Why is that? Anyone willing to take a guess? No implementation. no implementation. That is exactly why it happens. It's because our editor here has no idea. It does know about markup, and markup knows about the API, but our implementation has no, nowhere we set where is the implementation of that calculator. Okay? And so what we do in those cases? How do we solve that problem? How would you solve it? I guess most of you would do that. Pro, pro, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really betting money that this is how most people will solve it. 
because that's the most obvious thing. Okay, I'm missing the implementation, so I'm just gonna make my editor depend on that implementation. What's gonna happen if tomorrow is a better implementation? Well, we'll recompile it. Uh, we'll rebuild it, right? That's totally the wrong way to solve it conceptually. It's, it's the right way to solve it in Maven. But conceptually, it's the wrong way to solve it. Because basically what you need is this. You need to be able to somehow tell that markup and, uh, needs an implementation of that calc, and, and that implementation is anything that satisfies a particular expectation. So let's try to solve that problem. Um, and so from here, uh, I'm going to move my demo branch uh, come on, uh, to here. OK, and now I'm going to show you the difference. <coughs> Okay, can't not zoom this too much, but it doesn't matter, you're just gonna see the difference. So, th let's start with the API project first. So, the first thing we do, we change the POM file, and we introduce, this is the, something that I built, to the, for, it's just for demonstration purposes, and uh, just to you know, demonstrate how eventually Maven could be used one day. Uh, so, it's an, an extension for Maven. And uh, we also add this annotation thing. Now, this is a compile time dependency. You can safely use the jar file without that uh, dependency in runtime. And we have this, the, the, the extension uses this thing here called modularity manifest metadata true, which basically tells generate some metadata in the manifest file. So that's the guy with the zoom that actually sees what's inside and provides some information for you. And then we can say in package info, uh, can I zoom this one somehow? Can you see the text or should I zoom it in? Okay, let's see where it is. Uh, it doesn't work, I need to probably change it here. Okay, better? Okay, so now in your package, you basically say, well, guess what? I want you to put some meta information about the packages that I'm using. So basically, I'm exporting this package because other, other uh, jar files will be using it. And uh, also, you can give it a version so that we we'll know when things change. Okay, so that's all we do with the API. So now, we do the same thing for the um, uh, uh, simple service, uh, just using the extension and providing some metadata and providing the uh, annotations so we can use annotations. And the simple calculator, we add this thing, an annotation that says it provides a capability. Again, that's a compile time annotation. I can safely use this jar file at runtime, doesn't care about this annotation at runtime. So you basically say, this thing provides a capability, and capability is in the namespace fant demo fantastic, and it's called calculator. And that's it, nothing more. You just say, that's, that's what this thing does, okay? So now, uh, we can go to our markup. Same thing in the palm, we just add the extension so we can use the uh, extended information. And inside the markup, we have another annotation that says requires capability. So now we're saying that this markup does not depend on simple calculator, but requires a capability, requires anything that is in the namespace demo fantastic and uh, that is a calculator. So we provide a LDAP-like filter here. Basically say, find me something that can do those things. Otherwise, I will not work, okay? So now that we have those uh, informations in place, uh, we can actually uh, run it again and see uh, what's gonna happen. Uh, okay, so I, while I'm here, 
Um, I'm, I'm also creating another thing in here, this thing called repository. Uh, and we're going to use that in a second, but since we're here, I'm going to show it to you. So that is basically uh, a workaround right now to be able, so when you say this thing requires something and this thing provides something, you need someone to be able to resolve those things, right? And the naive expectation of most people is that, oh, wait a minute, we have Maven Central, so why don't we just tell the thing, go to Maven Central and figure it out? Well, this doesn't work. It doesn't work because the resolution problem is an MP complete problem. And it and, and means that you, it's a problem that you cannot solve in a, um, uh, in a defined time frame. Uh, so resolving against Maven Central simply does not work. But you don't need the whole Maven Central. You just need a small set of libraries uh, that potentially you want to use that you can update dynamically, and you can use that thing to resolve against. So what I'm doing here in this repository thing is I'm building a sub-repo of <clears throat> of uh, uh, jar files that I'm going to be using for the resolution. Uh, and um, I'm going to just uh, show you what is there. It's the markup. It's the simple implementation. That's pretty much it. Uh, and I use some plugins to generate this repo uh, and install it. OK, uh, I'll use that in a second. You will see how that works. So let's build a game. Uh, OK, we need to go to the demo O. Uh, clean install. Do you think it's going to work? Whoops, it failed. And now when it failed, it basically says that you cannot resolve, it cannot resolve what we ask it to resolve. So then we need to actually provide it with the, with the repository that it needs to resolve. So demo fantastic repository. And in here, I have my local Nexus running. And I created the repo, which is currently empty. It's called modularity. So in here, I'm going to say clean deploy. And if I'm lucky, then I have a new artifact in that repo, which is a simple XML artifact. And you can see it contains some meta information about the jar files. So it basically tells me which jar file contains what exports what and needs what and so forth. So now with this in place, um, I can go and build that thing one more time. Install. And it compiles all of a sudden. Right? And let's run this code again. Uh, where was it? OK. So now I have my fantastic editor here. And if I click Preview, it will work. Uh, I can actually, it's not hard coded. It actually works. Uh, OK, 2 plus 2, that's 4. It goes, works. So that's a very simple example of, of how we moved from defining a dependency on implementation to actually defining a contract. So we just said, well, this is what one site provides, and this is what one site needs. And we let this magical thing called Resolver to figure it out for us. Um, well, you can argue this is a fairly simple example. So, I'm going to show you a little bit more complicated one. Uh, here it goes. Okay. So in this example, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to build a RESTful service. So my RESTful service is going to use a Calc API to basically do some math. So I'm going to have a fancy REST where I can put you know, 1 plus 1, and it's going to tell me it's 2. How cool is that? OK, so how we do that? Um, the first thing first, um, uh, we have some settings that are not important. Uh, OK, I'm going to go back to that argument thing. Where is my API? API doesn't change at all. Uh, let me close that for you. 
Um, so uh, what happens in here is I also introduce another uh, implementation of my calculator. It's here, it's called Fancy. And that implementation is actually, let me show you here. Uh, where it is, that's the simple one. Uh, how do you refresh stuff here? Oh, here we go, fancy. So this one uh, uses an external uh, library uh, that is uh, known as Parsi. Uh, where it is, here, this one, and it basically delegates to, to, to this external library. Uh, now, that obviously means we have a, uh, a dependency on, uh, on that external library. And now, the tricky part is that external library uh, wasn't built by me, so it basically has zero metadata about what it does. So there's no way for me to just use it the way I normally, uh, I normally use it. But I can use a trick in this file, and I can say that uh, I can actually include that into my, uh, into my bundle, so it's gonna get embedded uh, inside my, uh, my, my jar file, uh, which I create. Um, so that's one thing. I introduce a new implementation, uh, totally, um, uh, totally uh, like different from the, the one that I had before. And, uh, uh, it uses obviously the exact same thing, provide capability, except it has some more metadata. So now it says that it can actually do addition and subtraction and it can multiply and divide and do the power of. Okay, so now what metadata I want to provide, it's up to me. I can define here whatever I want in, in a key value fashion, okay? So I'm providing a metadata that, okay, this my implementation is a little bit better, does more things. Um, so let's see what else I have. So now this is where I wanna build the RESTful service, and the RESTful service in here, uh, you can see it, it's uh, called CalcRest service, it has one uh, path with the expression, it's a standard Java JAXRS service, nothing fancy about it and it calls this calculator to calculate stuff. Now, the interesting thing that you see here is that I'm gonna be using a component framework, uh, and I, th therefore I'm gonna register it as a component. Uh, and uh, also I have these two annotations, requires JAX whiteboard, JAX RS whiteboard, and requires fantastic calculator. So where those came from? Well, they came from, from here, I defined them. So those are pretty much interfaces. So this is how it works. Require, uh, I just annotate an, inter an interface so I can later on use the interface instead of typing all this uh, require capability kind of thing. So in here I'm saying that this require fantastic calculator basically requires something of the namespace demo fantastic, which is a calculator and which has a property of power equals true. So basically you're saying here, I want to be able to use a calculator that can do powers, right? So, and, and, and you don't care where that comes from, just, you know, just comes from uh, uh, someplace. The resolver is gonna find it for you. Um, now the other annotation, JAXRS uh, uh, whiteboard, is basically saying that, well, since you're doing a, building a RESTful service, you need something that is capable of serving RESTful services, okay? And what do you want to do in a, in a normal scenario? You're gonna make it be dependent on a particular implementation of, of a REST server, right? That's gonna be Jersey, whatever. Um, uh, uh, in here, I'm saying, well, guess what? That's an OSGI contract, because there is a set of contracts defined by OSGI framework, um, and uh, the contract is Java JAX RS, and it has a property of whiteboard equals true. So anything that, that can do this, I'm good to go with. Well, the problem with that is that 
the implementation, the, 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 the servers that are capable of serving Java, uh, RESTful services, again, were not built by me, so hey, they have no metadata information which the resolver can use. So here goes the final piece, the augment jar. The augment is basically um, a, a standard jar file which only has one file in it, a text file, um, and this is augment. And in, in this text file, you can basically say, get a jar file and provide some more metadata about that jar file. So in here, I'm saying that, well, this is simply a, uh, an API, so I don't, want it, I don't want to use it at runtime, and that's why it's requirement that cannot be satisfied. It's compile only. And as for the uh, JaxRS publisher bundle, which I will end up using. This is the thing that works with, with RESTful services. I want to add to it a capability, and that capability is Java Jax RS and Whiteboard True. That is because I know this bundle can do this. And originally, if this was a real contract and we were in a perfect world where we were doing contracts instead of dependencies, this is what all maintainers should provide to their bundles, but because they don't, and they're unlikely to start doing it anytime soon, uh, we have this ability to actually provide additional metadata to already existing, um, uh, existing libraries. Okay, so, and uh, that's pretty much it. So let's try to uh, build that thing. Uh, okay, uh, I need to close. This one before. Okay. Uh. Oops, it didn't work. Well, it doesn't work because uh, we provided now a, 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 a extensive list of more dependencies. So if you look now into my repo, it also changed. Uh, where was it? Repository in here, uh, the palm. Uh, and now I also uh, put some more stuff in here uh, to like PAX logging and JaxRS publisher and so forth. So I, uh, I need a, um, a more artifacts in my repository to be able to reason about. So we need to update this repo first um, before things will work. So demo fantastic repository and maybe clean deploy. Okay. Now, what happened here? Oh, augment is missing, and it's, I, I didn't add it to the, okay, sorry for that. So we need to first create our augment thing, and demo fantastic repo, and clean install, I'm sorry, uh, clean, Deploy. So now it should work, and now you can see in my Nexus uh, modularity repo, I already have a new version of my uh, XML that I'm using to resolve things against, uh, and it's a little bit bigger uh, than it used to be. Okay, so now I can again go to my Demo fantastic all built and run clean install. Here we go. It, it was built okay. So remember, uh, just to show you again, uh, that the palm file of my REST service, where it is, uh, here it is. So the palm file, uh, it it's using the exact same thing, uh, the, the same extension, uh, and it only, only depends on API and annotations, two types of annotations. 
So it has no dependencies or JAXRS or any of those things. The only thing it has is this extension and a path to the repo uh, from where it can resolve uh, in here, oops, sorry, uh, in, this, uh, in this properties. Okay, and I'm specifying that my runtime is gonna be OSJ, but that's irrelevant for the, for the case at the moment. Um, so let's run this thing. Java jar. Uh, demo, fantastic, rest, target, demo, fantastic, rest, char. That's it. That's pretty much a, a Spring Boot kind of application, if you think about it. Let's go to localhost, 8080, services, call, should work. A, because I didn't provide now. So let's say one plus one. And it's two, so I have a very good restful services that can do basic math. Actually, just because uh, I told you that uh, you don't see it. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, now you can see it's two. Okay. Uh, so now you can do fancy things like two to the power of eight. Anyone willing to guess what's going to be? <laughs> All right. So. Okay, I understand those examples are like not the most uh, crazy thing that you've ever seen, but they demonstrate a, um, something that is a different approach to, to assembling an application. Um, and just so that you can see what is inside. So you saw the dependencies. I only had dependencies and annotations and APIs, but when you look inside my jar file, uh, target, demo fantastic rest jar, uh, it, it, it ended up having a lot of different things in there. It has all the fantastic projects, it has the runtime, uh, and it has this publisher thing, it has Jersey all, which is the restful uh, kind of thing. I didn't have to define those anywhere apart from saying that this is a capability that I need in my application. Um, if you compare this to uh, this jar file that uh, was created here, has nine megabytes, and um, this is how it looks inside. Um, I'll compare this, because I've done a demo some time ago uh, with uh, Spring Boot. Uh, I need to find out, it's probably somewhere here. So this is a Spring Boot thing. Uh, target, microservice, jar, uh, lip. So this is how Spring Boot looks inside. Spring Boot has about 15 megabytes, and it throws you a whole bunch of jar files in there, and half of those you don't need. But they are there because of the dependencies, because you, need, you depend on a jar file that depends on another jar file that depends on another jar file, and they just compile, compose them and throw them all inside that, uh, that application. So I hope this was enough to demonstrate the idea of how, what we can do. We're still getting there. Uh, can you return to the previous one? The, which one? No, right with the... Here? Uh, which one? The OSJ application, does it contain the augmented jar? Yes, it's the last one, the publisher. And it doesn't need it. It needs it. Why? Because that's the one that uh, actually does the whiteboard risk discovery. Isn't it only needed on compile time or assembly time? No, that's the jar that gets augmented. It's not the, the jar file that you use to augment other jar files. It's not there. I was asking for. A no, no, no. That, that's the one that we actually extended with meta information. Spring Boot has these starter jars that are basically kind of the same thing, but they're here usually. Mm -hmm. You cannot exclude them. All right, so, uh, so basically, this is the big picture. Um, uh, you, you, use, like, you store libraries any way you want to store them, and obviously that's going to be Maven for quite some time. I don't see people giving up on Maven anytime soon. 
But you cannot resolve against Maven Central because it's too big. So you kind of try to make a small set of, of, of libraries uh, to, uh, um, to be able to resolve against. And then you build this resolve context, which basically uh, tells you, uh, OK, those are the things I want to, those are the repos I want to resolve against, those are the augmentation, those are the things that I want to provide, and so forth. And then you run the resolver uh, against the context that you've created. So your responsibility is to actually provide the proper context. Uh, and repos should be kind of uh, one, one being a perfect world, uh, should be uh, kind of automatic because everyone should be providing meta information. Um, so you, you should supposed to be like just providing the context for the resolver, and then resolver should be able to go and discover things for you and assemble them based on requirements and capabilities. Um, but that's, that's not there. The, the last thing, which I didn't show you, but um, it's also possible to do, uh, is uh, uh, ability to resolve against a runtime. Now, I know we are all focused now on microservices, and we all want to build like standalone executable jar files. But believe it or not, there are still places where people use platforms and application servers and stuff like that. And when you want to do when you want to build an application that runs in one such environment, uh, you want to be able to also say, well, you want to tell the resolver, this is going to run in, I don't know, in JBoss or in WebLogic or in WebSphere or whatever. And it, if you put the proper context, you can actually wire the, um, uh, the context with the actual app server, and it's going to also take what's in the app server available into the resolving process. So it's going to build you a bundle, a, a class, a jar that works on the, on the particular environment. That's it. Thank you.